I V M. I want to tell you a story from my life. It's not as dramatic as the lives of those wealthy, violent kings and queens that I've been telling you about for the past month, but bear with me. I was doing an internship in Kolkata in my second year of college. Of all the places I could have ended up in, I was interning in a place that manufactured railway carriages, and it was one of those good old PSU types where people still use CRT monitors, and everyone was in the late fifties and only showed up for the evening chai and chit chat. Obviously, I didn't really have much to do there, so I ended up wandering the city instead. And so this was back when I just started reading about Indian history after coming off a long phase where I was super interested in of all things Greco-Roman military and political history. I went to the Indian Museum and I wandered into the Coin Gallery, and I was like, "Huh, you know, these are pretty, but I can't read Brahmi or Persian. I don't know. I don't find British coins interesting because they are obnoxious reminders of how Roman imperial culture was used to justify the colonization of India." And I was just about to leave the gallery when something caught my eye. It was a silver coin, only about an inch in diameter, but exquisitely cast. On it was a guy sitting on a galloping horse, brandishing a spear, and he was chasing another guy sitting on an elephant, running away from him. I looked at it and I said, "Huh, why does that image seem familiar?" So I stepped closer and I looked at the letters on the coin, and to my surprise, I could actually read them: Alpha, Lambda, Epsilon, Chi, Alpha, Nu, Delta, Rho, Omicron, Sigma, Ale, Alecandros. And then there was another word: mu, epsilon, gamma, alpha, sigma, megas. And then I realized what I just read: Alexandros, megas, Alexander the Great. And in that moment, it hit me: history is all real. It all actually happened. There was an actual dude in Greece who led a conquering army through the Levant, Egypt, Persia, who actually came here to India, and he actually defeated another guy called the Parva Raja, and he issued a coin to prove it. And somehow, through all the crazy, complex, chaotic paths that my life could have taken, I had ended up there in front of this coin that might have been touched by another human being just like me, whose story was first written twenty three hundred years ago. And how many such stories were there that I didn't know? I was looking around, blasted by waves of epiphany. I looked at all the artifacts in that museum, and I was suddenly engulfed in this vast ocean of history of the millions and billions of human interactions that brought me to where I was. I was lost, humbled, a speck in the infinite fabric of humanity, standing there gawping at that coin. But I knew I was part of it all too. And in the five years since, I've never stopped loving history. It makes me what I am. I step out of my room and I feel the heat of the sun, the trillion nuclear explosions happening every second, which part the earliest life, the simplest cells on Earth, my ancestors. I inhale the fumes of burning fossil matter from the Cambrian period half a billion years ago. I see birds descended from lines of avian dinosaurs a hundred million years old, my distant cousins, and I walk on a continental crust which drifted into Asia fifty million. Million years ago, and all around me, I see us, humans, my siblings. I hear our languages. I see our art, our advertisements, our food menus, our crafts, our economies, our politics, our loves and frustrations and heartbreaks and dreams and hopes and ambitions. And I know history has never died. If you know how to listen to it, it's ever present. The kings and queens who ruled us left their coins and their inscriptions, but our ancestors have left their stories, their words, their ideas. History, in a very real sense, echoes around us every moment of our lives. My name is Anirod Ganesetti. Welcome to Echoes of India, a history podcast. Just in case you're wondering, no, I did not tell you the story because I wanted to establish that I know the Greek alphabet. Because I don't, I just learned some letters for my engineering entrance exams, like I'm sure a lot of us have. But the reason I bring it up is to share with you, in some tiny way, the sense of humility and belonging that I felt in that unplanned random visit to the museum, because that's something that another visitor to Eastern India felt 1600 years ago. His name was Fasia, and he was a Chinese pilgrim. The fact that he felt what I felt, and that he wrote it down, and that I randomly bumped into his writing while I was researching a podcast about ancient Indians made me grin because you literally can't dream up situations like this, can you? Human experience is shared. The way we react to our world hasn't really changed in the basic ways over the thousands of years that we've even had civilization. 
now india and china are geopolitical rivals but this is a story of a time when indians and chinese interacted learned and created things together but first a little background how did buddhism come to china in the first place well what was happening in eurasia over the first few centuries ce we had the roman empire the parthian and sasanian persian empires the han dynasty of china the kushanas in northwest india blah 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 when we use these labels we often start to think that history worked out the way it did because hey look at these awesome empires that were so cool and huge and must have been so well administered and all their prosperity was because they had great kings but to put it bluntly that's utter nonsense if there is one thing that the story of asia tells us is that history is really made by networks of people not just kings but also the good old merchants and monks those motivated by money and religion to do new things make new connections you could have a huge empire that nominally controlled a bunch of people but those people would generally be left to themselves and try to do what was best for themselves unless they had the sword literally hanging over them if that meant being buddies with people who were claimed by other empires sure no problem history is not a story of mighty empires clashing so much as a story of enterprising people trying to get rich and or famous now a great example of just such a people are the sogdians Now the Sogdians were speakers of an Iranian language which unfortunately has more or less died out today and they lived in a fantastic place geographically they occupied the land between the Amu Darya and Ser Darya rivers basically parts of modern Kazakhstan Tajikistan and Uzbekistan as you can imagine this was a very interesting place to be because of constant nomadic migrations and attacks from everyone from the Indo Greeks to the Kushanas but by the turn of the first millennium things were starting to get really really good for the Sogdians The Kushanas dominated the region geopolitically which meant that trade could flourish without the risk of being disrupted by war and the Sogdians were positioned bang in the middle of the trading networks known as the Silk Roads and trade always brings business right whether you are participating in the trade or providing facilities like guest houses or medical treatment for travelers This was obviously fantastic for Sogdians. In fact, they were so enthu about trade and networking that they made a vast multi-ethnic web of relays and posts stretching through the mountains and deserts all the way into the thriving markets of China. Some of these guys are known to have settled in India and married Indian women, whereas their sons settled in Vietnam and married Vietnamese women, and their grandsons settled in China and married Chinese women. They were following and expanding the trade routes in search of profits, sure. But in the process they also began to absorb elements from all the diverse cultures they were in contact with. The Sogdians being Iranians were worshippers of Ahura Mazda, but they were deeply influenced by Indian artistic and iconographic traditions. So you see their gods represented with multiple arms as Vayu, as Surya, riding chariots and elephants, their representations of Shiva and Parvati and their bull Nandi and the Kushan goddess Nana riding a lion with multiple arms like contemporary representations of Mahishasura Mardini. elements of religion and art gleaned from the dozens hundreds of diverse cultures that they experienced along the silk roads gradually found their way into their own culture of course this pluralism extended to language as well you know how school textbooks tell us that ashoka maria was responsible for spreading buddhism through the whole world well i hate to burst your bubble but the only sources actually supporting that idea are from sri lanka and there are plenty of grounds to doubt that The biggest reason to doubt it is the simple fact that Buddhism only really caught on in China in the early centuries CE based not on early Pali texts but later Sanskrit texts and from there hopped to Japan. How it got to Tibet and Southeast Asia is a story for another episode. But coming back to the question of Buddhism getting to China, how do you think it happened? Did a bunch of monks hop into a private jet in Pataliputra and alight in Xi'an to enlighten the masses? No. I'll give you a hint. Here's a quote from a collection of biographies written in China around the 6th century. The fact that the dharma spread to the eastern land is clearly due to the merit of the translators who crossed the dangers of the deserts and drifted in huge waves of the ocean. China became enlightened because of them and their virtue should be venerated. And so I put them at the beginning of my book. Early Buddhism as we saw in our first season was extremely diverse with at least 18 known schools all of which dominated different parts of South Asia. The version of Buddhism that was popular in Andhra spread through trade and monks taking rides with traders into Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Similarly, the version of Buddhism that was popular in Gandhara spread through trade and monks taking rides with traders into Sogdia. 
in Sogdia, monks would have settled down and learned more languages and many Sogdians themselves became Buddhist monks and helped translate Sanskrit texts into Sogdian and thence into other languages such as those spoken in China. And given how diverse Sogdians were, some of them may even have had Chinese parents. As we've seen, they had networks that spanned huge urban centers stretching all the way from South Asia across Central Asia and into East Asia, right? So goods and texts were relayed from one point of the network to another, creating many local groups of Buddhist monks and merchants all interacting and communicating with each other. As Tan Sen Sen, the foremost scholar on historic India-China relations puts it, the transmission of Buddhist doctrines from India to China was a complex process that involved multiple societies and a diverse group of people, including missionaries, itinerant traders, artisans and medical professionals. The point I'm trying to make is that the historical interaction between India and China wasn't just about the peoples who live in the modern Republic of India or the People's Republic of China. It was really about the interaction of the peoples who populated the immense Eurasian landmass and even Africa, though that last bit is a story for another season entirely. Will you look at the time, we're halfway through the episode and I haven't even talked about our friend Fashia yet. As you can imagine, over the first few centuries CE, as trade and interaction steadily increased across Asia, more and more Buddhist schools and translations of texts began to reach China. And of course, since Buddhism across South Asia was a diverse and constantly evolving thing, the Buddhism that reached East Asia was just as diverse and constantly evolving, with inputs from all the intermediaries and translators that brought it there, as well as from East Asians themselves. The scholar Toru Funayama says that there were five major South Asian schools that had reached China. The Sarvastivadins, who dominated Gandhara and the Ganga Plains, the Mahasanghikas, who were a huge deal in Andhra, the Dharma Guptakas, who were big in Sogdiana, and the Mahishashakas and Mula Sarvastivadins. Alongside these established schools, which had their own varied practices and monastic rules, were Mahayana ideals. Mahayana is a broader grouping of Buddhist practices which heavily embraces the idea of bodhisattvas as active divine agents within the world, but we don't need to get into that right now. Point is, in China, Buddhism, diversity, diversity, diversity. Now, all these practices often coexisted in the same monastery and could be followed differently even by two monks who shared the same room. Now, unfortunately for Chinese monks, despite their strong religious convictions, they weren't really sure if they were going about it the right way because they knew they were working with translations, right? Were they disciplined enough? Were they following the right rules? How could they know for sure that they were following the correct teachings of the Buddha? All their texts tended to focus on the philosophy of Buddhism or the mantras and sutras and chants as opposed to the daily lived practice. And as Buddhism became more popular in China, people were looking to them for guidance. By the 5th century, things were in a state of some utter confusion. Though people were going between India and China, and many of them wrote fantastic travelogues about the glories of India, no Chinese monk seems to have made the whole round trip successfully. And in the year 399, a wiry old monk by the name of Fashia, who lived in a huge city called Chang'a, decided that he would simply have to go to India, collect the original texts on monastic discipline, the Vinayapitakas, translate them and bring them back to China. I quote from an account that he wrote of his travels, though I've changed the third person narrative to the first person and simplified the language. I was living in Shangan and was very worried because of the mutilated and imperfect state of the collection of the Vinaya Pitakas. And so I agreed with four other monks to go to India and seek the rules of discipline. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of this gentleman and realize the enormity of what he had just committed to. Fashiam was already about 60, a very well-regarded monk, and he could have settled down to a peaceful retirement. Instead, he had decided to walk hundreds, thousands of miles across some of the most hostile terrain on earth in search of his holy land, a place that he had only ever read and heard about. It was a land where his heroes and his gods had come from, where their relics were worshipped, but beyond that he knew very little about it. And yet he had decided to expose himself to the fury of nature, the dangers of disease and banditry, to wear down his own body, struggle through the pain, cross mountains and rivers and oceans to get to India. And he didn't even know any Indian languages. But as I said, it's people like him, like you and I really, not the great heroes, but the determined little people who change history. And that is precisely what Fashia would do. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's retrace our friend's journey. Fashia first had to trek all the way out of China proper and get to the merchant routes which crisscrossed Asia like a vast web. There he would have been able to get rest, supplies, medical care and also learn about the geography of the routes that he had to follow from travelling merchants. 
He raided great oasis cities such as Dunhuang, where traders stopped for supplies or to well trade. Significantly, he mentions that these cities often had vast repositories of Buddhist texts, but these, of course, suffered from the same issues as the texts in China. So onward he went, meeting people who looked Chinese but wore Indian clothes and prayed to Indian gods, people who had mini stupas outside their homes, and all sorts of strange and interesting things which may have blown this elderly monk's mind. He saw monasteries where hundreds of monks assembled when a single gong was struck. He saw kings and queens and noble women and parades. He even saw stupa which supposedly contained the Buddha stupraash. Though Fashian doesn't seem to have realized it, a lot of the relics he saw were just fakes that had been manufactured later. But he was clearly quite moved by such encounters anyway. Onward he went through the city states of Shan Shan, Khotan, and Agni, all of which were, to quote Sain, vibrant centers of intra-regional trade. Then came the first big obstacle, crossing the Pamir Knot, where the Himalayas and a bunch of other mountain ranges meet. Fashian rather endearingly calls them. The Anian Mountains. We went west from Ladakh towards North India, and after a month's effort, we succeeded in getting across and through the Anian Mountains. The snow rests on the peaks in summer and winter, and there are poisonous dragons who spit winds and cause avalanches and sandstorms. Not even one out of ten thousand travelers survives this journey. After the crossing, a terrible blizzard hit. One of Fashian's companions began to shiver uncontrollably and lost the ability to walk, and the other monks couldn't help him. He begged them to leave him and continue onward with their mission. And poor Fashian wept over his friend's frozen corpse. But onwards he went through Gandhara. Where he saw the gorgeous images of Maitreya and the thriving stupas and monasteries that we visited last season, in all their colorful glory, ringing with bells and the sound of chanting, he went to Purushapura, the capital of the long dead Kushan ruler Kanishka, and saw his great stupa, four hundred feet high and decked with jewels and colorful glittering banners, waving in the breeze. Also, though Buddha was a North Indian who never ever actually visited Gandhara, Gandharans had by this time developed all sorts of stories about how Buddha had visited and left his footprints and done all kinds of stuff here in his previous births, which is a wonderful way to legitimize new religious practices if you think about it. Poor Fashia, not being aware of all this, happily accepted all these myths and was really very touched by these profound experiences and his discussions with Gandharan monks. But he hadn't really reached the place that he considered to be the true heartland of Buddhism yet. The Ganga plains were still a ways away, and so onward he went. Fashia saw India with the rose-colored optimism of a true believer, and so he only spoke about Buddhist practice and presented the subcontinent as being a land of great virtue, ruled by noble kings overseeing a happy population. A lot of historians have used this testimony to paint the Gupta Empire as some sort of golden age of peace and prosperity, but as I've pointed out earlier, that's problematic. Our friend was in North India in the early 400s, when the vast region was still being consolidated after the campaigns of Samudragupta, and Chandragupta II was busy in Central India building Udayagiri and campaigning against the Shakas in Gujarat. Fashia was quite lucky to have reached North India when he did, and he could happily wander from city to city, monastery to monastery, stupa to stupa, without worrying about any marauding armies. Instead, what he saw was the emergence of a new wealthy class that was competing to build temples and public works since they had been crushed and stripped of their military power by the Guptas. So, when he finally reached the great city of Mathura, the geopolitical key to the Ganga Plains, where the Indo-Greeks had battled the Shakas, and the Shakas had battled the Kushanas, and the Kushanas had battled the Guptas, he was mightily impressed by the wealthy, sophisticated Sanskrit-speaking elites that we've talked about in earlier episodes. But he didn't really know how they had gotten to be that wealthy, or even the fact that their generosity was something that they were doing as part of a public performance of ethical conduct. That didn't stop him from getting very excited to see how supposedly virtuous and generous they were, of course. But because Fashian was here at this critical moment in Indian history, at this transformative moment, really, he was able to give a picture of Indian society that really appealed to other Chinese people. You see, most Chinese people at the time generally had a very dim opinion of the eating and dressing habits of other cultures. 
Now, when they saw Farshian's glowing testimony, they began to think of India as different, as a civilized place that Chinese people could visit and have diplomatic and business relations with. Here's a Chinese writer quoting Farshian about a hundred years later. From Mathura to the south, all the country is Madhya Desa. Its people are rich and they dress and eat like the Middle Kingdom. Therefore, it is called Madhya Desa. Madhya Desha is the land between the Ganga and Yamuna rivers, among the most densely urbanized regions in the subcontinent. As we saw in episode 3, this was also likely the political and economic heartland of the Gupta Empire, between Madhya, the two sacred rivers. But the way the Chinese interpreted the term Madhya Desha was that Indians saw themselves as being at the center of the world, just like they did. You see, the Chinese name for China is the Middle Kingdom, Chonghuo, and later translators, inspired by Fashia, would sometimes use the same word to describe both Madhya Desha, North India, and China. So this sort of mutual respect between the two regions, as we'll see, would profoundly shape the global economy in the centuries to come. Now, given that our friend had already read travelogues and Buddhist fables about India before coming here, and given that he was writing for an enthusiastic Buddhist audience at home, and also given that he was experiencing possibly the high point of Buddhism in the subcontinent, the high point of this ancient religion, which was much better established here than in China, we shouldn't really be that surprised about the utopian vision of India that emerges from his writings. To Fashia, all Indians were totally fine, Buddhism was fine, all Indians were mostly Buddhist, and they weren't violent or intoxicated or warlike and luxury loving. This conflicts with Indian sources that we have, which point to a time of much greater turmoil and change. You see, Fashia didn't fully grasp the importance of some of the changes that were afoot. He didn't know about the rise of temple-based Hinduism, he didn't know about the deadly struggle for elite patronage between temples and monasteries, and he didn't realize that the temples were winning. Deep politico-economic transformations were afoot. Only 16% of the Gupta inscriptions we've ever collected record donations to Buddhists, which means that even if Buddhism was not being persecuted outright, elites were clearly no longer patronizing it as much as they used to. And commoners were increasingly drawn to donate to gods in temples that elites were building to legitimize their new political authority. Buddhism, though nobody would have said so at the time, was on its way out. And even Fashian saw some signs, even if he didn't really dwell on them. As he passed Gaia, for example, he found that, to use his own words, all was emptiness and desolation. But then not far off was an ancient monastery where people still donated to the monks and the rules established over the 800 years since the Buddha's enlightenment were still being followed, which excited Fashian to a great extent, as you can imagine. It seems that the ancient Indians who met Fashian were just about as curious about foreigners as modern Indians are. During his travels, when he was asked where he was from and replied that he was from China, Indians were completely incredulous at the thought that anybody would come all this way on a pilgrimage. And really, his religious optimism and sometimes oddball superstitions aside, one is amazed by Fashian's grit. He notes that one has to be careful of wild elephants and lions on the roads in one line, and then calmly mentions how he continued onwards anyway in the next line. He went to the Himalayan foothills where Buddha was born and bemoaned the sad state of the ruins, which is something else that ancient India apparently had in common with modern India. He went to Pataliputra and was gobsmacked by the colossal remains of the palace of Ashoka Maurya. I saw the king's palace with its various halls, all built by spirits who piled up stones, constructed walls and gates, and carved them with designs, engraved and inlaid. These things cannot have been made by humans, and it is still standing today. What an experience our friend must have had. Being in our vast, ancient land, soaking in its history and myth, and also seeing it at a time of great religious change with the eyes of a true believer. But then again, I'm digressing. What about Fashian's story resonates across the centuries, and how is it similar to the yarn about Alexander's coin that I started this episode with? When Fashian reached Rajagriha, after all these trials and tribulations and wanderings and exultations, he climbed a hill called the Vulture Mountain. Here, 800 years ago, Siddhartha Gautama, the Enlightened One, the Buddha, had stood on the peak and preached a great sutra to the crowd that watched him. Here he had lived for months, meditating, resting, teaching. Here, 
kings and crowds had come to listen to him his rivals had been humbled by his insights his disciples had stared in wonder and began to think about what would happen after his death and buddhism the religion which had been entrenched and transformed by so many diverse peoples which had traveled all the way to distant china to which fashian had dedicated his entire life was born two senior indian monks guided fashian to the peak and there he stood imagined and felt the presence of buddha easily the most transformative human in all of history tears welled up in his eyes and he collapsed fashian wept at the thought that he had not been able to see the buddha but only saw his relics and perhaps he also wept for all that he had lost along the way and perhaps he wept at the realization of just how lucky he was to experience this connection and as he burned incense and dedicated flowers to the dead man and chanted the sutra that buddha is supposed to have preached there fashian and i had the same oceanic sense of connection humility and belonging 1600 years and many many worlds apart he'd been on the road for almost a decade but his mission wasn't done yet at a seaport on india's east coast this extraordinary man then almost 70 settled down in a complex of 24 buddhist monasteries learned sanskrit and spent 3 years translating and studying to his heart's content then he took a ship south along the coast past the thriving cities and stupas of andhra to sri lanka and collected texts for another 2 years before he finally decided that he had what he came for In another testament to the connectivity of the ancient world he boarded a merchant ship carrying almost 200 other people and set sail for China where as you can imagine he became a rock star overnight and died peacefully having experienced the most amazing things that humanity had to offer never knowing that his story would change so many lives and touch the hearts of people that he could never see or dream of I want to hear what you think of Agoras Keep in touch with me on Twitter at akanisetti that's a k a n i c t t i or tag me in an Instagram story just search for my name if you like this podcast you could also leave us a rating and a review and don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network you can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast.com and while you're at it follow us on Twitter and Instagram as well at IVM podcast How does one separate news from opinion? I'm Mahro Khanayat, a news junkie, but not a big fan of debates. I love facts, and I like to stick to them. No frills, just pure analysis. This election season is Balakot a game changer for 2019? Did Priyanka Gandhi Vadra join politics too late? The Chokidar Wars. Who's really winning? I will cut the clutter and analyze the stories that matter to you. You can listen to the show on the IVM Podcasts app or wherever you get your podcasts. Do you have a night routine? Well, everyone has one, and the to-do list usually looks like this: brush your teeth, set that alarm, get into your pajamas, and switch off those screens. But here's one more to add to that list. Tune into the Positively Unlimited podcast for a dose of positive action and tips on how to build powerful mindsets. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you tune into podcasts.